Oh, wow. Bless you. I, um, I actually don't know what to do to follow up on that. Uh, thank you. Lisa looked at me and she said, you would have already failed on that list. The caramel mochi. I can't even say it. Um, she sent me, we were on our way somewhere one day a while back and uh, we were in a hurry to leave town and she had a list of things that she needed. And we stopped at a Walmart which is my, obviously my favorite place to go. And uh, so she took her list and she tore it in half and she gave me half a list and she took, and she said, you get this half, I'll get this half and we'll meet at the front of the store. We're in a big hurry. So I pulled up, dropped her off. I went to find a place to park. Between parking in the front door of Walmart, I ran into this neatest couple. And <laughs> they, were, they were an older couple. They were, they were driving this, absolutely gorgeous RV. And I made a comment about the RV and the guy said, would you like to see it? And I absolutely love to see it. And so I went up in, uh, in the RV and um, looking at uh, the, the thing was absolutely amazing. I'm sitting on the couch handing a drink with him and um, <laughs> my phone beeps and Lisa says, I'm at the front of the store. Where are you? I just forgot about the list. So obviously I wouldn't have done very well on this thing. Things have changed for us. When we were pastoring on, on Father's Day, we did, um, I mean, I, I know it wouldn't work today, but we did things like uh, who had the largest shoe in the room. Um, we would uh, measure and see who had the longest belt. That, that probably wouldn't go over so well today. Um, we started, we'd have guys line up at the front and kneel down a little bit and we would start judging to see who had the tallest forehead. Um, we stopped doing that when I started winning that contest and, uh, but, um, anyhow, it's so good to be with you. Uh, Pastor Stan and his family have been close to us for a long time. I, I remember years ago when, uh, Claude Qualls and I sat with Stan and, uh, talked him into coming here. I think there was like 25 or so people in the school down the road. And um, as you can tell, we are all so grateful that Stan said, yes, this is where God wanted him. And uh, God has done some tremendous things in his life and through his life and through his family. And we're super proud of them and, and how God has used them. And it truly is an honor uh, for us to be here today. Lisa and I, for years, so we traveled to speaking different places and now at this season of our life hopefully we can travel together more we just got back last night we took our final class in our doctoral journeys and we're doing together hers is on a, she's getting a doctorate in spiritual formation and I'm getting a doctorate in leadership development and now we're on our projects and uh, we just love we've journeyed together in life and uh, so that's just what somebody asked what we're doing now. 40 years ago, Lisa and I drew, uh, we were dating and uh, we just, uh, if God could do anything in our lives, what would it be? And uh, we were sitting at a little diner splitting a burger because we couldn't afford to. And um, we just drew on a napkin what we believed God would really do with our life and what we would like to um, just believing what God would lead us to do together. And 40 years later, we're stepping into that dream of having a retreat center for ministry leaders that are just going through, just need time to refresh. And God is giving us an opportunity to do that. Isn't God amazing? You know, 40 years puts a, a dream in a couple of kids and, um, God is just big enough to fulfill those dreams uh, more than you can ask or even imagine. That's how big our God is. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above anything that you can ask or even think. The problem is not what God's able to do. The problem is oftentimes we're not dreaming anymore. We are not excited about what God could do anymore. We're not, we are, we are passing through life, taking it one step at a time when God wants us to be dreamers. What is it that you really believe God could do in your life? And, and then don't believe small. 
because he's going to do more than you can ask or even think or even imagine. So God is the, the challenges. Imagine God doing something so crazy with your life that you would never think it could ever be possible. And lo and behold, even though it might tarry, wait for it. We've been waiting 40 years. And um, I think the test was to see if Lisa could live with me for 40 years, but uh, we've passed that test. And, but anyhow, God is, God is so good. I, I realize through the years of pastoring, we pastored in Farmville for 20 years and um, uh, served this region as a presbyter. That's how Stan and I got so connected. But um, I, I realize that in all, this, uh, all these years of speaking, you probably are not going to remember a word that I say next week. It was quiet, but that probably would have been a good time for an amen. You're not, you're just not going to remember. I mean, as good of a communicator as Stan is, you probably don't remember a lot what he said three weeks ago. What happens is the Holy Spirit just takes a word or two and deposits something in you. And somewhere along the line, you remember something. All of this is about the nurturing and the growing of your soul as you are drawing closer in your walk with the Lord. And so realizing that, I just want to give you one word. I'm going to give you one word from Scripture that perhaps this afternoon you'll think about maybe putting that word on your refrigerator or something. And every time you see the word, perhaps you will remember this passage passage of scripture. And the one word that I'd like for you to just jot it down somewhere, put it in the notes of your phone or, or pretend you're putting it in the notes of your phone as you're texting people. Okay. But just, just do so. And it is just simply the, it's simply the one word wise. W I S E on father's day. If I could speak anything into your life, it would just simply be this. Be wise. Be wise. I want to show you something in scripture about a young man. He was probably just a, a teenager when King Saul was told by God to go and um, accomplish something that God wanted him to do with another army. And, and the king wasn't quite obedient to what God was speaking to him. You can read the story in 1 Samuel 15, 16, 17. And so the anointing that Saul had as king was lifted from him. And a, the word of God says a dark spirit was put on him. In the meantime, Samuel now is looking for who was going to be anointed as the next king. And he goes to Jesse, has Jesse bring all of his sons before him. Not this one, not this one, not this one. You can read the story for yourself. I'm certainly just highlighting a point. And finally, it gets down to the, the least of these, the youngest son, the ruddy one. If the Bible says that you're ruddy, you probably are a mess. Uh, you'll get that when you go home. Don't worry about that. The, he, was, he was the ruddy one. He was the one that Jesse didn't even think was significant enough to even bring him before Samuel. But yet Samuel said, none of these. Do you have another son? Well, I do. I, yeah, I guess I do. He's out tending sheep. But, but there was something about that moment that even Samuel said that we're not going to be seated until he arrives. Something, there was something about presence, something when his name was even mentioned that they, that Samuel had them all standing until somebody went out in the field and brought that young man in, just a kid. And when he was brought in, the ruddy one, the insignificant one, the one that really didn't matter too much was brought in immediately. Samuel said, this is the one. The anointing of God was upon David as a young boy. I don't know how that works. I, I certainly don't know how the anointing works. I, I don't profess at all to, to have the wisdom of God as God anoints some with unique and special anointings. And I do know this, that in the Old Testament, the anointing was really about them or upon them. Uh, there's been a change in New Testament when Jesus came and, and before he left, I, I have to leave, he says, so I can send the comforter. When he comes, he's going to take of mine and reveal it to you. And of course, we know what happened in Acts chapter two. And the whole premise of that is that the Holy Spirit would not be about us or just upon us, but that the Holy Spirit can be within us. 
that we can walk with the presence of the Lord abiding in us. We do believe he's around us. He's upon us. He goes before us. But, but the Old Testament creates the picture of that, that now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the pr- Spirit of the Lord abides within us. But David had a unique anointing upon him. And the story of this young man, just as a as a young man, probably in his teenage years, he is um, confronted by a bear and God helps him. He's confronted by a lion and God helps him. And and we wonder why, what is going on with this guy that, that there's such an anointing upon his life. One of the things we find out is when this, when this spirit that's upon Saul at this time would come upon him, he would ask for someone to help him, someone to come play music. And, and someone in the palace said, well, I know of this, I know of this boy that plays the harp. And there's something about his heart playing. And sure enough, the king says, well, please bring him. Somebody's got to help me. And when this boy comes in and starts playing the harp, the dark spirit leaves Saul. There's an anointing upon him as a young man that even as he plays the harp, the presence of the Lord. This is sort of a side note in case you're wondering, two spirits can't abide in the same temple. So when the spirit of God shows up, any other spirit has to leave. He's not giving you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. If, you, if you're wondering why all this stuff is happening in your, in your life, in your family, in your home, then I would implore you, seek the presence of the Lord. Go home and pray for the presence of the Lord to fill your home. Just speak God's presence, speak God's favor, speak God's blessings. It, it somehow changes the environment of your home, and it certainly can change the environment around you. There was something about David that there was such an anointing upon him that he would come and play uh, his harp and the dark spirit that was upon Saul would be lifted. His father tells him one day, I want you to go down there. They've been in this battle that's going on and, and, and the giant that represents the other army would come out into the field and challenge any Israelite, anyone from the tribe of Judah even. If you want to come out and challenge me, and if you win, we'll be your servants. If I win, you're going to be our servants. But no one would go to the valley and challenge the giant until this boy shows up. Some believe about 18 now, 19. He comes down to the field, leaves his flock because his father has sent him with lunch for his brothers that are fighting in this battle. And when he goes down, it just so happens to be the moment of the day when the giant comes out into the middle of the field in the valley between the two mountains. And he's standing in the field and he proclaims it again. And David just happened to be there. And when he sees it, he he just looks down and he said, is there anybody going to go down and challenge this? And I think for the most part, you know the story how David talks to the king about, I'll go down. And the king finally gets hey, talked into it. David says, I, I, I killed a lion. I killed a bear. What is this one? Saul tries to put his armor on David, but it didn't work. As you read the story, I, I encourage you to read the story for yourself when you leave this afternoon. Not that I'm going to be preaching until this afternoon, but I mean sometime this afternoon. So David goes down, he picks up five stones and and here is the dialogue for a moment that happens with this teenage boy and a giant that was just a couple of inches from being 10 feet tall. He says, you come before me with a sword and a shield, but I come before you in the name of the Lord. You see, this teenage boy knew something about presence and knew something about about God's anointing. He didn't quite figure it out all the way to be a king, but he knew there was something special there. He told he told King Saul about it. There's something special. I don't know, but but that man down there shouldn't be challenging the armies of God. And he went down to do it. I'd like for you to see something in First Samuel chapter 18, a, a couple of verses of scripture. I don't know. I I know they. 
I, there's one there, 18.5. I want you to see something in these first couple of verses. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. The verse says, and Saul sent him over the men of war and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servant. Doesn't sound like too much in that verse of scripture until you understand the point that all of the men of war that was under King Saul now starts turning towards David because there was tremendous favor upon David's life. Something was happening with David that not only did the men of war respect David, but all of Saul's servants. There's another verse too from... In verse 14, and David behaved wisely in all his ways and the Lord was with him. As you read through the story, you'll see where it goes now from all of the the men of war and the servants of Saul now are favoring David, something special about David. And now you see in verse 14 that David behaved himself wisely and the Lord was with him. Let's go on to one more verse. Same chapter, then the princes of the Philistines went out to war and so it was wherever they went out that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul so that his name became highly esteemed. Now we get to the place where this young David, the nations feared him. And what did he do? He just simply behaved himself wisely. We know some of the exploits that he did. We know what happened with the giant when he took the sling and he tossed the stone and the, and the giant fell and he took the giant sword and cut his head off and he presented the head before Saul and the king had already made the decree that, that whoever defeats this giant, that, that you'll receive the, the, all the, the splendors and gifts and my daughter and so forth. And when David presented, this boy presented the head of the, of the giant to Saul. Saul says, well, well I, I think we, uh, you need to go out and fight the Philistines and bring back a hundred. And, and so David goes out. Saul was thinking the boy goes out and fights again and, and has that much to fight. He's surely going to be put to death. And, and, and instead, David came back with twice as many as he was sent out to get. There was an anointing upon this young man's life. And and, and, and you know the story of how Saul became jealous and threw his sword at David, how Jonathan befriended David in such a way, Jonathan being about 30 years older. And and Jonathan would have seen him as just a, a spiritual little brother because they both would have known what it was like to go into war alone and defeat the enemy. You can, you can look at all of the, the story itself and there's so many subplots and sublines and, and, and traces of this and that. It's sort of like climbing the tree and going out on a limb. There's so many limbs in this story that you could stop on and just gain such spiritual insight. But I just want to touch on this one word, wise. How is it defined in 1 Samuel chapter 18? It's defined this way. I mean, you're going to find several definitions if you were to look it up, but I'm just going to give you one of the definitions that, that I have found. That, that is it, Do you have it? The word wise is defined as inside information or being close to the source. These guys in the booth there, you guys are awesome. I came in this morning. We, we got in last night from traveling, driving from Missouri. And um, this morning I handed them some notes and I said, is it too late? Not at all. And so you guys are awesome. Inside, they said that Stan does that to them every morning anyway. <laughs> so they were used to it. Um, Stan, if you're listening, I just wanted to, watching uh, that. They told me that I had to say that. Uh, wisdom, inside information. I, I was watching this past week, one evening, I can't remember where it was, Lisa, what hotel room or B&B, but it was a, there was a baseball game on. And the coach in the dugout did, did one of these, you know. And the, the announcer that was, that was sort of announcing the game by game on TV said, wow, you have to be an insider to know what that was all about. 
And if, you've, if you're in the room and you've played ball, you know what it is where the coach gives a sign to a base coach and the base coach then relays the sign to the runner to know if it's a time to steal or wait, whatever, or perhaps to the pitcher as to what next, the next pitch to throw or whatever. And, and you learn signs. And the signs are only known by those that are close enough to know what the signs are. And I thought of that as I was listening to that. The announcer said you'd have to be pretty close to the source in order to get that. That's exactly the definition of the word wise in 1 Samuel 18. Being close enough to the source, being close enough to the source as if you have inside information. How do you do that? You do that by getting, by getting into the presence of the Lord and understanding the presence of the Lord. You can look at David's young life. He knew what the presence of the Lord was about. He understood the presence of the Lord. I had the privilege so many years ago, as it just a, I was a teenager myself when, when Benny Hinn was just starting his ministry and had the privilege of of sitting with him for dinner one evening. And he shared with me, I, I didn't really grow up in church like, like you see most, a lot of pastors today, a second, third generation. That, that is not my story. And so in my, the early years of just trying to figure things out, you're all ears, you're listening to everything. And he, he said to me, he said, Frank, in every service, every gathering, and by the way, it's the gathering of the Holy Spirit. You're only here today because the Holy Spirit has gathered us. If God knows the plans that he has for you and how he has laid out your life, he is well aware that you've been assigned to this moment. He's well aware of that. So we're in this room as a gathering. And as he was explaining it to me, in every gathering of the Holy Spirit, there is a moment in that gathering where the Holy Spirit enters the room. It's his meeting. It's his meeting. And, and we can sing the songs that you are welcome in this place, Holy Spirit, or have your way in me, Holy Spirit, or we want more of you, God, and we want to see your face and such beautiful. And by the way, this worship this morning, you guys are so, that, that is just, we could have just sat here and just worshiped. Amazing. But, but there's a moment that the Holy Spirit comes in the room to speak the word that you have been gathered to hear. And, and as, a, as a leader, he was sharing with me, as a leader, you have to be sensitive to that moment. Because if you're not sensitive to that moment, that is how you grieve the Holy Spirit. The world cannot grieve the Holy Spirit. The world has no relationship with the Holy Spirit. You and I have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. If you're saved, if you're a child of God in this room today, you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You know, you sense it when there's something in your spirit, something that doesn't feel right, something that, that might feel good. You know the moment where the Spirit of the Lord is speaking something to you. The Word of God says that my sheep know my voice. You know. You know that. So here is this young man that, that has behaved himself wisely, he had inside information because he was close to the source in presence. And because he was close to the source in presence, all of the men of war followed him. All of the servants served him. The Lord's favor was upon him and the nations around him feared him. That is a tremendous anointing for this young man who is going to be the next king. He hasn't even, he hasn't even stepped on the throne yet. And, the, and those in battle served him. Servants served him. The Lord's favor was there and nations feared him. It sounded like he was walking in a good place. It sounds like he's got everything he needs to accomplish whatever it is that God is calling him to do. How does that happen? I want to give you just my thoughts on how that would happen in the Psalms as he authored some of these. Look at these couple of verses, if you will, with me in Psalm 30. Four, one. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Everything that comes from his mouth is blessing, not discouragement. The things that
that come from his mouth are those things that, that are favorable, not things that would tear things down. As a father in this room, hear that. The things that come from your mouth, are they blessing or are they cursing? Let's go to the next one in Psalm 42. One. As a deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs for you, O oh God. There is something inside of him that was pursuing presence, and the only way he could share it in a picture form would be as a deer pants for water, so my soul is longing for you. So dads, hear me if you would. All of us, listen to this word. Out of your mouth comes encouraging things, not discouraging things. Comes blessings, not cursings. In your heart, in your soul, there's a longing for presence, just as a deer would pursue the water brook. One more if you would. Psalm 75, 1. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your wondrous works declare that your name is near. Not only do you, do you speak encouragement, not only is there a soul that's longing for more, there is a testimony that you have. You're speaking the things that God can do and that God has done. How many of you in this room could lift a hand and say, I have a testimony? Come on, I have a testimony. How many of you know God is Savior? How many of you experience salvation? Is there anyone in this room that's ever been healed? Anyone around this room, look, just look around as the hands go up. Has anybody been provided for? Isn't, isn't God good? If you lifted your hand at any one of them, and, and there, there are many things that we could lift our hands on as God has delivered us and changed us and, and made a way for us and moved mountains for us and raised up valleys for us and visited us and spoken to us. Many have seen answers to prayer and hands could go up around this room. That's the testimony. We speak blessings, not cursings. There's a heart that's desired more of the things of God. And there's a testimony that we can declare at how good our God is, that we have a good, good father. This is what David, the psalmist, is writing about because it's the things that he has experienced. One last verse. I, I want you to see this for a moment because I, I do believe this is one of the ways that we can discover more presence in our life. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Highlighted the word magnify because if you're speaking about God, God can't get any bigger. God is as big as he is going to get. How many of you believe that? God's not getting older. He's not getting wiser. God isn't growing up. He's not learning on the fly. Whatever has happened to you this past week or is going to happen to you, God is well aware of. It's not going to be a surprise to him. He's omnipresent everywhere, present, omniscient. He's all-knowing, om omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He always has been. Even eternity has a time connotation to it. God is. God is, period. How long has he been? God is. How long will he be? God is. God is. And, and we have to try to put it in some type of time, but God is. God is as big as God's going to get. But what did the psalmist mean about magnifying the Lord? Remember back in school, having a, in, in a middle school, whatever, they'd give you this little Petri dish. And and in that little Petri dish, it put something, sometimes moss or, or mold or something, and give it a couple of days in the refrigerator. And, and, and then you pull it out. You look at it. It doesn't look like anything has changed. But then you take the little slide out, and you put it under a microscope. And when you put it under a microscope, all of a sudden, what was in that dish was magnified. And you see these little amoeba things moving around in there. And it was, it was the coolest thing to see. But you couldn't see it with the naked eye because it had to be magnified. How does God become so magnified that we feel like we're closer to the source? We can, we can see things that others can't see. How does that happen? How does God become magnified? He becomes magnified the same way the psalmist knew when he started playing his harp. Friends, something happens when you begin to just worship the Lord. Something happens when you just begin to just celebrate him and thank him and, and speak his name. I believe when you came in this room this morning, the presence of the Lord was here to greet you. But something happens in a room when you begin to worship him. 
It's like the presence of the Lord increases in my life. What I have learned is as I worship him, it seems like he trusts me with more of himself. It's like there's presence there. I love the presence of the Lord. I, I just believe it's God's presence and God's anointing that was on my life, called me into ministry. And I could share with you so many testimonies today of God's grace and God's goodness. But the one thing that's a common thread that has been woven through my life story is just a greater desire every day for more of God's presence. When I came in and heard the worship team practicing this morning, I didn't want to leave the room. I just sat there because there's just something about presence. I love the presence of the Lord. Dads, when you get hungry for the presence of the Lord as a deer pants for the water brook, I'm telling you, things change in your family. Things change in your marriage. Things change in your home. I wish I had time today just to share my own testimony of how those things of just worshiping the Lord and loving Jesus changes things. If you're a dad in the room, would you mind standing with me across the room? And all the dads that are in the room, pray, we, we pray for you that this is the, the best day ever, best Father's Day you've ever had, that there'll be just a unique anointing upon you this day and that, that there will be something that comes upon you that'll draw you closer to the Lord. I encourage you to write the word wise down somewhere, perhaps on the leaf of your Bible or on a sticky note on the refrigerator. We, we know you don't frequent the refrigerator, but in case you do, if your family is with you, if you're here, your family is around you, would you mind standing? We're going we're gonna to close out the service with just a, a prayer for our dads, but the prayer is going to come from family. So if family is here, if you don't mind, would you put your, your hand on dad's shoulder, your husband, put your arm around him, and, and we're going to just lift up a prayer in this room together. Father, we love you. If you're, if you're here by yourself, maybe just stand and stretch an arm out towards a, a brother or friend or someone that is here that you can pray for. Father, we love you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you, God. Thank you for the example in your scripture of the one, Lord, that understood presence, had such an anointing upon his life that, God, you used that anointing. Lord, the word continues as we grow and we learn. We discover that, Lord, we are all children of your presence. And your presence can be magnified in us. Your presence can be magnified around us. And Lord, I pray for every dad in this room. God, may they take heed to these words today. Be wise. Just be wise. And in wisdom, seek to become closer to the source. Lord, I speak blessings and favor upon their lives, upon their families, upon their homes. Lord, I pray that you'd bless them when they go out. Bless them when they come in. Lord, let today just be a unique day today as we walk in your presence. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. Amen. Bless you.